So this video is on the nervous system and it's part two. Part one covered the structure of those neurons, those nerve cells, and it's really important that you get that. If you don't know the structure of the neurons, go back and learn it before you go on to this material. So we learned in the last video that the nervous system is all about detecting stimuli, which results in an electrical impulse being generated and carried towards the central nervous system. However, the stimulus must be of a particular strength or a certain strength in order for any impulse to be carried. And the threshold is the minimum stimulus required for an impulse to be carried. So this then leads us nicely into the all or nothing law. If the threshold is reached, an impulse is carried if threshold is not reached, no impulse is carried and you just have to know how to state that. So next is the transmission of the impulse. The big thing about this is be able to state it involves the movement of ions and just know that ions are charged particles. You don't have to even know the particular ions. I'm just going to mention them. It's sodium ions and potassium ions and it's really the sodium ions that do most of the moving. So the reason why I have the salt and the banana there is just to remember sodium in salt and potassium in bananas, the salty bananas. So you'll know that sodium ions are always on the outside of a neuron and potassium ions are usually on the inside side of it. When a neuron is at rest, it's more positive on the outside than the inside. The inside is more negative and the reason why it's more positive is because there's lots of sodium ions on the outside. Then the detection of that stimulus, which is at the threshold, causes a change in the permeability. The neuron at that point, its membrane becomes more permeable to sodium ions, so they move from the outside to the inside. So now that point, the inside of the neuron, is more positive than the outside. So once this initial change in permeability is started, it makes other areas of the neuron more permeable. And this is how the impulse travels along. This process will continue along the neuron. And this is the way in which the electrical impulse passes down through it. And as soon as the impulse goes by a certain area, it resets by moving or pumping those sodium ions back out. Sensory neurons and motor neurons have a myelin sheath and there are gaps in between this or spaces known as the nodes of Ranvier. And it's only at these nodes where the permeability has to change, not the whole way along. So in these neurons where there is a myelin sheath, the nodes of Ranvier is the only place where the permeability changes. And so this speeds up the transmission of the impulse. Eventually the impulse reaches the very ends of the neuron. And this is where there are these swellings known as the neurotransmitter swellings. And these are to facilitate the impulse being passed on to the next neuron. The region where two neurons come into close contact is known as a synapse. You can see in the picture the neurotransmitter swellings in close contact with the dendrites of the other neuron. So this is a synapse and you can see here in the diagram, this is it blowing up and you can see that it's made up of a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. So before the synapse and after it. The space in between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron is known as the synaptic cleft. It's the gap and it's into this synaptic cleft that these special chemicals, these neurotransmitter chemicals will be secreted. So in this example, we're discussing what happens to an electrical impulse when it reaches the end of one neuron and enters into these neurotransmitter swellings. Remember, these are only on the end of a neuron, and that's really important because it ensures that the electrical impulse goes in one direction only. So when the impulse reaches the neurotransmitter swellings, there are these little bubbles or vesicles which contain neurotransmitter chemicals. These vesicles will fuse with the membrane on the presynaptic neuron and they'll release the chemicals the neurotransmitter chemicals into the synaptic cleft. The chemicals will diffuse across to the beginning or the top of the other neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, where there are special receptors. They'll lock in or attach to those receptors and this generates the electrical impulse in this neuron. There are many neurotransmitter chemicals. You have to know some examples. So just give dopamine and acetylcholine. Make sure you remember those. So let's just take a look at this again. This is the synapse, the area where two neurons come into close contact. And we've just been discussing how the electrical impulse passed down one neuron until it reached the neurotransmitter swelling here. This resulted in these vesicles that contain these special chemicals called neurotransmitter chemicals fusing with the presynaptic neuron membrane. This released the neurotransmitter chemicals into the gap, the synaptic cleft. They diffused across to the post synaptic neuron where there are special receptors into which they attach. This results in the regeneration of the electrical impulse.
So what happens to the neurotransmitter chemicals after this? They get broken down by enzymes and the products go back to the presynaptic neuron where they are remade into neurotransmitter chemicals. And the reason why we have all these mitochondria in the presynaptic neuron in the neurotransmitter swelling is because this requires, this rebuilding requires lots of ATP. Lastly, we have to look at Parkinson's disease. It's a disease of the nervous system. We have to know its name and we have to know what causes it. It's a lack of dopamine. And the symptoms are tremor, usually in the hands, fixed stare, shuffling walk, stiffness of joints. And we also have to know how we treat it. Parkinson's is treated by usually administering medicine, drugs for example, and they mimic dopamine and levodopa is a common one so know its name. Unfortunately Parkinson's is degenerative, it's a degenerative disease which means that it will get worse. The stiffness and the mobility issues are treated very well with physiotherapy. So what caused Parkinson's and how would you prevent yourself from getting it? Well, firstly, they're not 100% certain on what causes it. There are some genetic links and there is some evidence to suggest that exposure to chemicals such as pesticides is linked with developing Parkinson's. So your best bet is to avoid exposure to these toxic chemicals, wear protective equipment. So at the end of this video, know what is meant by threshold, state the all or nothing law. Describe how an impulse is transmitted, state it's the movement of ions. State that the transmission of the impulse is electrical, chemical, electrical. Describe what a synapse is. Describe what is the synaptic cleft. Outline how the impulse is transferred across a synapse. Explain how the synapse ensures the transmission of the impulse in one direction only and outline the details of Parkinson's disease. So best of luck, the only way to revise this is to write notes and do exam questions. Good luck.